So good morning, everybody, and welcome to this, the 31st annual social policy conference uh, that we have organized. Um, a special welcome uh, to everybody who's here live, and also a special welcome to everybody who has joined us online uh, from around the world. Uh, you're all very welcome, and uh, a special welcome, as I say, to those who are watching us uh, from outside the venue here in different places. When we hold a conference like this, or when you maybe plug into a conference like this, context is obviously critically important uh, in the kind of discussions that we have in a conference like this. And it's important to situate the context for today's conference. Um, we as societies across the world have been making a major mistake for more than a century. This mistake has been repeated over and over again. We believed that economic growth would lead to all other priorities being addressed effectively and efficiently. The belief that economic growth would trickle down to benefit everybody in a fair and just manner was, and continues to be in fact, widely uh, accepted without challenge. Of particular significance in the context of today's conference is that programs for government have invariably given priority to economic growth over everything else. Not always, but for the most part. While many of those programs for government have been very successful in generating economic growth, they have not succeeded in having those resources that are created uh, transformed into the levels of services and infrastructure or of equality and inclusion uh, that most Irish people would support or desire. And despite being one of the richest countries in the world, Ireland today has three quarters of a million people living in poverty, more than three quarters of a million in fact. Uh, of these, uh, a quarter of a million are children, 100,000 of them, more than 100,000 have jobs. But not just that, there are over 700,000 people on waiting lists for healthcare. There are over 500,000 homes without broadband in the country. There are uh, over 11,000 people homeless, if you count the real figures. Uh, and in, there are close to 80,000 households on waiting lists for social housing. And I suppose the situation is compounded uh, by the fact that government has no real plans of sufficient scale to address these challenges that are currently uh, being faced. Uh, there are plans there, all right, but they're not of sufficient scale. The issues that I have raised are not the only issues. We have failed on the, uh, and are failing uh, profoundly on the environment, on climate change, on a whole range of other issues as well. It's clear that generating economic growth is not enough. More is required if we are to have a society which addresses the basic needs and promotes the basic rights of the population. So looking at this situation from a slightly different perspective drives us to a similar conclusion. Economics teaches us that the measure of a people's well-being is the volume and variety of the goods they can consume. This has led economists to promote the maximization of everything that promotes consumption. Consequently, companies are allowed to access and use new technologies to organize the divisions of labor, to promote economies of scale and of the market, um, and to uh, be mobile in a whole variety of different ways, in any way, in fact, that they wish. The prioritization, it's not, it's not so much that we obviously have a problem with uh, scale or with uh, technology or with mobilization or whatever. It's the prioritization of the consumer and of the market that has produced growth and products that weren't even imagined a generation ago. And some of that is quite good. But something has gone wrong during those years. Huge economic, social, and political divisions have emerged. Many have rejected the way the ways of these resources are distributed, the way decisions are made, the values that underpin this approach are the divisions that they have produced. Recent political developments in the United States, in Germany, in Brazil, in France, in Italy, in Austria and beyond uh, testify to this rejection. And the convictions of economists about well-being and related issues don't seem to be acceptable to ordinary people to a great uh, extent anymore. And I suspect a large number of people have also rejected the tearing apart of the very fa fabric of local communities. Now, these are the kinds of contextual issues that form the background to this conference today. 
We're asking a question from here to where. And throughout the day, we'll hear from different people with different views, different voices, different proposals for where Ireland should move in the years ahead. And we look forward to you fully engaging with the discussion and to contributing your ideas to the discussion around the topic that Ireland so desperately needs uh, to have addressed. Uh, this applies not just to the people here, but also to the people watching us online. Uh, you're more than welcome to participate and to uh, contact us with suggestions, ideas, whatever, and we're more than happy to take those aboard as well. So, to get the conference underway and to the proceedings of the conference and the presentations and so on, um, I will invite uh, our regular chair at these events, uh, Mick Clifford, uh, to uh, say a few words and introduce our first speaker. Uh, Mick is, needs no great introduction. A uh, very well-known journalist, a journal, former journalist of the year in Ireland and uh, working at the top of his, of his uh, capacity at the moment and doing a great job with the Examiner and with a number of other outlets as well. So over to you, Mick. Thanks very much, Sean. And you're all very welcome. And I think it's fair to say we have a very... Engage, what I would suggest is very engaging and certainly varied program of speakers today. And uh, starting off that program, we have Paddy Cosgrave. Paddy, as many of you will know, is the CEO and co-founder of the Web Summit. And I also think it's fair to say that Paddy is somebody who, unlike perhaps an awful lot of people who are very successful, particularly who are very successful young, he is very much engaged with public life and the political sphere. And I think this is something very much to be welcomed. So would you have a welcome, please, for Paddy Cosgrave. Thanks so much. Um, so nothing I wish to share today is related to anything I've learned running uh, a business. I think as Adam Smith and writers from antiquity, good writers from antiquity onwards, uh, have observed, there's often a mistake in virtue and wisdom afforded to those who have amassed great fortunes. Neither wealth nor influence affords me, in my view, any moral or intellectual authority. If anything, the views of those who've attained excessive and unusual privilege should be, if history counts for anything, treated with the deepest of scepticism. As an undergraduate, I was the editor of the undergraduate academic journal for what I believe is now the School of Social Sciences and Philosophy in Trinity College, Dublin, for two years. I later co-founded another similar academic journal. My interests a decade ago in matters of political, moral, or economic philosophy remain largely unchanged. Although in recent years, my ability to spend much, if any, time properly considering these topics has reduced dramatically. This is yet another reason to treat my observations today with the deepest of scepticism. I'm professionally entirely unqualified to talk about the important matters being discussed today, so I wish to take a somewhat broader historical um, set of observations. I'm nevertheless very grateful to, to Sean and Social Justice Ireland for the invitation. Just to note, much of the material I reference today has in part been initially gleaned many years ago from the footnotes and bibliographies uh, of books by authors including Howard Zinn, Hajun Chang, Noam Chomsky, Michael Hudson, Bertrand Russell, uh, and many others. So to begin. When the founding fathers of the United States of America were in the 1770s discussing from here to where, they predicated their recommendations on a set of philosophical beliefs regarding justice and human nature, as well as observations on the distribution of power within their nascent society. This period continues to animate and inform much discussion today about the distribution of power and decision-making internal to Irish society. For example, America's founding fathers are regularly invoked by Irish political leaders, and as such, their writings are worthy of closer examination. While the founding fathers were concerned primarily with how you might best organize a just society and guard against the subversion of the public good, other moral philosophers writing in the same period were, and I say this with some caution, somewhat more concerned with economic considerations. This set of moral philosophers, most particularly Adam Smith, are also invoked both directly and indirectly by Irish political leaders as the philosophical antecedents for many of the policies pursued in Ireland today. Personal choice, the free market, hard work, just reward, and classical liberalism are amongst the words and ideas that are commonplace amongst the utterances and speeches of those in power in Ireland today. 
for those interested in influencing policy decisions in Ireland and understanding of the supposed philosophical roots of these policies regularly invoked by those in power has therefore some utility. For that reason, we'll turn first to some of the underlying foundations of the avowed philosophical positions of our political leaders in Ireland today. Initially, we'll focus on the nature of political systems and the distribution of power within those systems, and thereafter turn to an examination of the avowed philosophical roots of economic thinking of our political leaders. In 2016, Enda Kenny, speaking in the United States alongside Vice President Joe Biden, observed that down through the generations, Irish leaders drew enormous inspiration from the ideals of your founding fathers. It's an important observation by Kenny and is to some of the ideals of the founding fathers that we first turn. James Madison was one of the co-authors of the Federalist Papers, the fourth president of the United States, and regarded by many as the father of the American Constitution. Madison wrote that if elections were open to all classes of people, the property of landed proprietors would be insecure. For that reason, he concluded, our government ought to secure the permanent interests of the country, the interests of the minority of the opulent, against such innovations as universal suffrage. In short, Madison understood that civil government was established, as he put it, to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. Alternatively, as it was termed by Madison in Federalist Paper Number 10, perhaps the most famous of all the papers, democracy is permissible, but only if it guards against wicked projects of innovation by those without property or the hope of acquiring it. Another of the three authors of the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton, who Taoiseach Leo Varadkar described recently as the great founding father of America, believed that the majority were an unthinking mass with all the folly of the ass who must have a master as they were only made for reins and spur. John Jay, the final of the three authors of the Federalist Paper, simply concluded that the people who own the country ought to govern it. When Leo Varadkar and Akeni conclude that Irish leaders have drawn enormous inspiration from the ideals of these great thinkers and leaders over many generations, I'm sometimes not sure if they mean these specific ideals or not, in particular because the observations I've shared of Madison, Hamilton and Jay are deeply relevant to some of the most entrenched challenges uh, in Ireland today. Returning to the Founding Fathers, it is important to note that this class of men, as they refer to themselves, believed that the public good would be protected through the benevolent actions and decisions of gentlemen and talents, of, of gentlemen of talents and characters, uh, and character, as they put it. Actions that would be guided by what they termed truth. However, their benevolent aspirations were soon threatened by what Hamilton declared as a dangerous tumor within democracy itself. Hamilton wrote that a new monopolizing spirit of speculation threatened to destroy the benevolent aspirations of the Founding Fathers. It was a dangerous tumor that, in his words, must be corrected. If it were not, then democracy itself would devolve into a system which would merely, he added, rob the industrious of the fruits of their labor and enable the idle and rapacious to live in ease and comfort at the expense of the better part of the community. Madison, like Hamilton, warned of a comparable future where government would be found substituting the motive of private interest in place of public duty, leading to a real domination of the few under an apparent liberty of the many. Thomas Jefferson, another founding father, foresaw a similar future, but Jefferson hoped that the benevolent philosophers could crush, in his words, in its birth, the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations, which dare already to challenge our government to trial, to a trial of strength and bid defiance to the laws of our country. Let me just say that again. Thomas Jefferson foresaw a similar future to all the other founding fathers, but hoped that the benevolent philosophers could crush in its birth the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations, which dare already to challenge our government to a trial of strength and bid defiance to the laws uh, of our country. I think it sounds somewhat familiar to some of the challenges we face today. When Leo Varadkar recently referred to Hamilton as that great founding father of America, was it any of Hamilton's concerns of a dangerous tumor at the heart of democracy in a young America that Varadkar felt made him so great? Hamilton's observations and those of many of his contemporaries and the dangerous relationship between moneyed corporations, that's essentially concentrated private power, and democracy itself are very apt in the case of recent Irish history. When Enda Kenny concluded that through the generations Irish leaders drew enormous inspiration from the, deal, from the ideals of your founding fathers, 
Was it their concerns that a politician might be found substituting the motive of private interest in place of public duty because they were because they would be overwhelmed by a new aristocracy of money corporations. Given our long history of scandals resulting from the interplay of money corporations and our political classes, the words of the Founding Fathers on these issues are difficult to ignore. The views of the Founding Fathers on the dangerous tumour that has concentrated private power were also constant, and not just from the earliest days of the United States, but right through the next 100 years. Ireland's ambassador to the United States, Dan Mulhall, noted recently that Alexei de Tocqueville was the author of a book that some regard as the best thing ever written about 19th century America and its politics. His observations, therefore, on the dangers of private power overwhelming the public good are worthy of some consideration. For example, in 1831, de Tocqueville urged any friends of democracy in the United States to keep their eyes anxiously fixed on the manufacturing aristocracy which is growing up under our eyes. He believed that it was one of the harshest which has ever existed in the world. Moreover, if allowed developed unchecked, would lead to a permanent inequality of conditions, thwarting the initial aspirations of the Founding Fathers and replacing democracy for the people by gentlemen of talents and character with a system amounting to a real domination of the few under an apparent liberty of the many, to borrow Madison's observations once more. Speaking in the White House this year, Leo Varadkar said, in my office, I keep and I treasure a collection of speeches and letters by one of your greatest presidents, Abraham Lincoln. I wonder if the Taoiseach treasures the following observations of Lincoln in one such letter in 1864. Lincoln warned that the worst fears of the founding fathers had been realized as, in his words, corporations had been enthroned. He added that an era of corruption in high places will follow and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. Lincoln's conclusions are perhaps an exaggeration, but they are not without an element of documentary legitimacy. Lincoln's warnings, like those of the Founding Fathers, represent a very consistent set of views with regard to the dangers of concentrated private power overwhelming the public good by capturing political power. This is Hamilton's dangerous tumour at the heart of democracy. That the names of these towering figures are invoked by those in power today in Ireland is, of course, notable. But what's far more notable is the total silence with regard to the many and consistent observations by these historical figures on the dangers of private power overwhelming the public good and capturing much of policymaking in their own interest. From historical observations on political power, let's now turn to the often invoked philosophical basis for various policy positions with regard to matters of work, income, and taxation of the current Irish government. Minister for Finance, Pascal Donoghue, has over many years declared that Adam Smith is everything from the anchor of our modern world to the author of the famed Wealth of Nations to someone who decisively changed how we view the world. Smith, therefore, is worthy of careful consideration, as are the views of those who inform Smith and those who were influenced by Adam Smith. At the core of the Enlightenment, post Locke at least in my view, was a general agreement on a new division of income. This new division eventually unshackled much of the Western world from the last vestiges of feudalism or aristocratic privilege. This division, in turn, influenced ideas on taxation, work, and productivity right into the modern period. This new division divided income into two parts, unearned income and earned income, known sometimes as unproductive income and productive income. One form of income added to the wealth of a society, as far as all of these thinkers were concerned, the other detracted from it. Unproductive or unearned income was castigated as everything from useless to parasitical to a subtrahend to most famously by John Stuart Mill as the unearned increment and then some more. Ultimately, this important division lay at the heart of political economy right through the Enlightenment, informing everything from taxation to public investment to banking. This most crucial division of income seems unfortunately to have been entirely missed by the current government. So what was unearned income? Adam Smith perhaps best described unearned income. Landlords, like all other men, love to reap where they never sowed. This, this description was echoed for more than 100 years to come by almost every major political economist and moral philosopher. John Stuart Mill, for example, writing probably about 70 years later, wrote that those who own assets often grow richer, as it were, in their sleep without working, 
risking or economizing? What claim have they on the general principle of social justice to this accession of riches? When Leo Varadkar invokes imagery of the deserving getting up early to work, he seems entirely oblivious, entirely oblivious of what was the absolute core division of income during the Enlightenment. This division lay at the heart of critical debates with regard to taxation. There was a broad realization that in order for economies to thrive and exit the death grip of feudalism, the interests of landlords had to be subordinated to that of industry and consumers for the first time in hundreds of years. For example, David Ricardo concluded that the interest of the landlord is always opposed to that of the consumer and manufacturer, adding that the dealings between the landlord and the public are not like dealings in trade, whereby both the seller and buyer may equally be said to gain, but the loss is wholly on one side and the gain wholly on the other. Put another way by Adam Smith in Wealth of Nations, which Pascal Donahue seems fond of referring to, some people foolishly confound rent with profit. These are fundamentally different things, and the division of rent and profit, unearned and earned income, was one of the cornerstones of Enlightenment thinking. Perhaps the current government have confounded rent with profit, to say the least. Returning to the past, it's important to remember that some of the ideas of Smith and those that followed were perhaps most informed by the contribution of the French physiocrats. This group of Enlightenment thinkers were arguably the first to extensively use the term economiste to refer to themselves. The physiocrats produced perhaps the first true national income statement known as the tableau economique. In their view, it isolated the surplus or produit net of an economy and consequently who or what should be taxed. In the 1750s in France, significant asset owners were exempted from taxation. Taxation of various sorts were levied overwhelmingly on working people and small business owners. The physiocrats, through the zigzag of their tableau economique, identified landlords as receiving the largest and most unjustified surplus of income. As this income was essentially unearned, it therefore should be taxed, and taxed heavily. The physiocrats, of which Quisnay was their intellectual le leader, called for a lompot unique, or unique tax, that would fall mostly on large asset owners. Adam Smith was more than aware of the physiocrats. Smith noted in his famed Wealth of Nations, as Pascal Donohue refers to it, that the tableau economique, with all its imperfections, is perhaps the nearest approximation to the truth that has yet been published upon the subject of political economy, and is upon that account well worth the consideration of every man who wishes to examine with attention the principles of that very important science. The physiocrats' battle cry became laissez-faire. The word laissez-faire comes from the physiocrats. Initially, it was laissez-nous-faire, laissez-nous-passer, and we can maybe discuss that later, later, which properly translated was simply to mean let the population at large, working people, be free of unjustifiable levels of taxation by shifting the burden onto those, in the words of Mill, who often grow richer, as it were, in their sleep without working. At the time in France, to reiterate, large asset owners were entirely exempted from tax, while everyone else was not. Under the physiocrats' laissez-faire proposals, that was to change. A free market was to be cre created, which at the time essentially meant a market free of an unfair system of taxation. But what's more, not only were those with large holdings of property exempted from taxation at the time in France, similar to asset-backed funds in Ireland at present, luxury goods were also subsidised, much as is the case today in Ireland with, say, art, but also with education and healthcare. The mere existence of what are called S110s, or ICAVs, or LQIVs, these exceptional tax breaks for large asset owners, is entirely anti antithetical to the very basis of classical liberalism. It's the opposite of the very cornerstone of Enlightenment ideals with regard to tax, work, and reward. The only way Pascal Donahue could refer to Smith so liberally is if neither he nor his advisors had ever properly read Adam Smith. To be clear, Adam Smith did not shirk from suggesting that large property owners should be heavily taxed, something they are absolutely not in this country. A tax upon rents, Smith wrote, would in general fall heaviest upon the rich. He added that it is not very unreasonable that the rich should contribute to the public expense not only in proportion to the revenue, but something more than in that proportion. Adam Smith furthermore condemned taxes that fall much heavier upon the poor than upon the rich, in particular on the necessities of life. 
perhaps echoing the physiocrat's call for a Lompot unique, a unique tax on assets and rents, Smith wrote that rent on assets was the species of revenue which can best bear a peculiar tax. When Leo Varadkar made reference to those who wake up early and work, he was, I would suggest, entirely unaware in his defense of the most important division made during the Enlightenment with regard to economics. All income is not equal. Some income is earned, some unearned. As Adam Smith lamented, though, some people foolishly confound rent uh, with profit. The Enlightenment was in many ways a struggle between unusual privileges granted to large asset holders, which had held Europe in a dark age, and an emerging industrious movement which promised to unleash the forces of new wealth creation through work. Much of the work of Enlightenment thinkers like Smith was an attempt to subvert the interests of huge asset owners, like hedge funds today or private equity funds. These large asset owners of old are the equivalent today in Ireland of various funds who have been granted feudal-like tax breaks and income derived from the ownership of large volumes of assets. For many generations, Adam Smith's ideas and those of his contemporaries informed taxation, public spending, and even ideas on banking. Taxes on capital gains, for example, used to be levied in the Western world at broadly the same rate as other forms of income. But now in Ireland in particular, as was the case in feudal France, a certain class of people and organizations who hold large amounts of assets are granted extraordinary privileges. They are, in short, through various asset-backed fund structures, exempted from taxes entirely. The special privileges afforded today in Ireland to asset-backed funds, be they hedge funds or otherwise, represent nothing more than old aristocratic privilege infused with modern marking, marketing techniques. Structurally speaking, exemption, exempting a certain set of huge asset owners from taxation in 2018 is no different from 1750s France. Interestingly, Adam Smith, in fact, wrote about the particular case of taxes and foreign owners of assets in Ireland in Wealth of Nations. Odd that Pascal Donahue would miss this one. Those who live in another country contribute nothing by their consumption towards the support of the government of that country in which is situated their source of their revenue. If in this latter country there should be no land tax, nor any considerable duty upon the transference either of movable or of immovable property, as is the case in Ireland, such absentees may derive a great revenue from the protection of a government to the support of which they do not contribute a single shilling. For Pascal Donoghue and Leo Varadkar to invoke Enlightenment thinkers and ideas without any seeming knowledge appears nothing less than a very unfortunate misappropriation of history. Their misappropriation, or the misappropriation by their advisors and speechwriters, represents the exact problem Michael D. Higgins cited in his inauguration speech with regard to anti-intellectualism. The current government's continued confounding of rent and profit, an absolute critical division of the Enlightenment, is most unusual. But so too is their proclivity to continue to reduce, and in some instances entirely remove, any forms of taxation on large asset holders, while simultaneously subsidizing the purchase uh, of luxuries. This runs entirely contrary to quite literally the core purpose of the Enlightenment, the, to end the unreasonable dark ages and exceptional privileges granted to a minority at the great expense of almost everybody else. Pascal Donahue also, I should add, heaps praise on David Hume. I'm a, fan, I'm a fan of Hume for various reasons, but I also happen to own a copy of his, it's, it's, it's worth buying, a three and a half thousand page history of England in which Ireland features frequently. As an Irishman, it's difficult to invoke Hume in the context of Ireland if, that is, you've actually read much of what he wrote about Ireland without at least acknowledging one of his most spectacular observations uh, on the Irish, which I'm sure many people here uh, have heard before. The Irish from the beginning of time, had been buried in the most profound barbarism and ignorance, as they were never conquered or even invaded by the Romans, from which all the Western world derived its civility. They continued still in the most rude state of society and were distinguished only by those vices to which human nature, not tamed by education or restrained by laws, is forever subject. I think we worked out, things worked out okay for us in the end, but those are David Hume's actual views on the Irish. Um, so it's difficult to difficult to continually invoke him, I think, without acknowledging that most famous line. Similarly, if you actually actually read Adam Smith's famed Wealth of Nations in the, word of, in the words of Pascal Donoghue, it's hard to miss his peculiar observation on potatoes and Irish prostitutes, which I've seldom have ever heard nor read in an Irish context. So I'll share it. 
With potatoes, the chairmen, porters, and coal heavers in London, and those unfortunate women who live by prostitution, the strongest men and the most beautiful women perhaps in the British dominions are said to be the greater part of them from the lowest rank of people in Ireland who are generally fed with this root. No food can afford a more decisive proof of its nourishing quality or of its being peculiarly suitable to the health of the human constitution. I, th I think it's an unbelievable observation. If you're kind of uh, interested in different types of bread, the paragraphs before that is actually Wealth of Nations is an obscure book in some ways, but it's actually a, de it's a debate about whether wheat-based bread or oat-based bread uh, is more nutritious. And then he just kind of uh, decides that actually potatoes um, are, are the ultimate source of uh, strength and beauty and cites poor, unfortunate Irish women working in prostitution in London as, as, as the basis for his argument. Um, it's, it's an interesting book. To conclude, the great tendencies of our most senior political leaders to invoke America's founding fathers or Adam Smith should in some sense be welcome. As Cicero once noted, not to know what has been transacted in former times is to be always a child. If no use is made of the labors of past ages, the world must remain always in the infancy of knowledge. I understand that by quoting the great ideas of these thinkers, our Tishi and finance minister believe they are demonstrating a certain intellectual competence, that they are not in the infancy of knowledge, to quote Cicero, or anti-intellectual, to quote Michael D. Higgins. And yet, in some ways, it may appear that their absolute misappropriation of the Enlightenment uh, and, and its ideas shows that they are deeply anti-intellectual. However, I, I don't believe our political leaders are anti-intellectual. Instead, I think they're very very, very smart. They rightly realize that there's, there's just no philosophical basis for many of their co core policy positions today with regard in particular to work and taxation. Faced with that reality, they simply have to pretend there is a basis by falsely appropriating the ideas of some revered enlightened ph philosopher or political idealist from the distant past and hope nobody kind of calls them up on it. In the closing paragraphs of the final chapter, chapter 24 of John Maynard Keynes' general theory is a rather excellent summation of what I have shared uh, and want to end with. I, I just think it's a brilliant, brilliant kind of closing paragraph. The ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. I'm sure that the power of vested interests is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. Not indeed immediately, but after a certain interval. For in the field of economic and political philosophy, there are not many who are influenced by new theories after they are 25 or 30 years of age. So that the ideas which civil servants and politicians and even agitators apply to current events are not likely to be the newest. But sooner or later, it is ideas, not vested interests, which are dangerous for good and evil. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Thanks very much for that, Paddy. Um, I've always believed in the centrality of the spud myself, I have to say as well. But um, uh, we're going to open it up to the floor there. Anybody, any, any questions, please, just in relation to Paddy's um, speech there, just make yourselves known to our roving microphones. Um, Paddy, one, one thing that strikes me, I have to say, is you, you, you seem to be suggesting uh, that modern-day politicians in this country are appropriating or misappropriating the, the, the musings of some philosophers to, to, to give their uh, policies some kind of a, a philosophical basis. Would there be a case to be made that there's very little philosophical basis to their politics and they're merely managerial is, is, is how, they, how they perceive their, um, their entire uh, political philosophy? Um, well, I, I think there are, some th th there are some kind of philosophical kind of basis for some of their ideas. So Sean referred to trickle-down economics, and it was, um, it was Malthus who was kind of the father of trickle-down economics. And he, he, he was hired by landlords in, um, in England at the time to defend their privilege against the kind of slow encroachment of David Ricardo's um, ideas. Uh, you know, and I think the, the closest thinker um, in terms of ideas might be Malthus to the, to, the, to the kind of current government. But I don't, I don't think outside of maybe a Milton Friedman or somebody like that, many of Fine Gael's ideas have much, have much basis in history.
back to outside of feudalism itself. Yeah, um, I'm here for Kitty to mic there, please. Um, I would have thought. Um, thought that there's very strong philosophical basis to the current policies and that's um, the Chicago School of Neoliberalism which is um, rampant now throughout the Western world and is causing us, as I can see in my journalism, huge misery and destruction for the majority of people um, who um, don't benefit from it. Um, would, would you not think that, that there's a very, very strong um, ideological basis to what's happening? It's not just flailing around in the dark and hoping. Yeah, I mean, if you t if it, so take Milton Friedman as an example, probably the kind of most known um, father of the Chicago School. So Free to Choose is you know, his best-selling book that he wrote with his wife Rose. If you just read the opening paragraph, he refers to Adam Smith as the father of modern economics, much the same as Pascal Donoghue, uh, and his Wealth of Nations is a masterpiece. Friedman, much the same as, say, Kenneth Arrow, just totally misappropriates Smith and... Uh, you know, I just I think they apply the same rubric as uh, you know maybe the speechwriters maybe not directly Pascal Don and Leo Varadkar or it's not kind of fair to pin them for responsibility for their own words um, they 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 just they apply broadly the kind of same rubric the the ideas themselves those of the Chicago School twenty years before were kind of laughed at as being utterly preposterous um, and slowly they kind of. Uh, gained currency, uh, and to legitimise them, they had to throw the kind of cloak of history over them, and you know they did that reasonably, uh, reasonably effectively. But I don't, I don't necessarily think they're good ideas. Sorry. I suppose you can pick and choose, though. Can you take what you want from Adam Smith and leave out the bits you don't like? I think that's hard. I think he's relatively consistent through through kind of wealth of nations. I mean, even 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 his argument for the invisible hand, which was in say book four, uh, section two. If you just go back a few paragraphs, I mean, it's he's making an argument for why investors in England would be dissuaded from investing their capital internationally. Uh, because they'd be affected by some type of psychological effect. Um, he was kind of making an argument for behavioural economics, as if nudged by, a, by, by an invisible hand. But th that concept was just widely misappropriated. It wasn't at all what he kind of implied. And I think if, if you read much of Smith, he's pretty consistent in that regard. Um, yeah, we've somebody here. Hi. Um, delighted to hear your references to the American founding fathers. One of the... Uh, policy matters that it's, of which Social Justice Ireland is a, is a great advocate, is basic income. And Thomas Paine is, is, is viewed as, the, as one of the original uh, authors of that policy. I, I over email with, with Sean, I mentioned that I, re I really don't know enough about basic income. All I can really say is in the United States, um, uh, as a concept, <clears throat> It seems to be de debated an awful lot by people um, as, a, as, a, as a solution to many of the kind of problems related to the future of work in the United States. But I think underemployment and unemployment and growing levels of inequality, oftentimes it's stated that the root cause of that is technology and that it's increasing, increasing roboticization uh, and AI that's replacing jobs. And as a consequence, soon there just won't be enough work for people. I actually don't believe that uh, for two reasons. One, if you take the kind of best work out of both Korea and Japan, where there's more usage of robots than anywhere else, you can see that more robots equals more work for people. It's just different work. It doesn't, it doesn't systematically destroy uh, jobs. It just cyclically reduces them. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, I just worry sometimes that ba basic income as a, as a debate, it obviously has, you know, huge merit and I don't know enough about it, but it's a convenient excuse among some in the United States to kind of disregard and ignore some of the underlying causes of gross inequality and growing inequality uh, in the United States. There's lots of things to be done. There's highways that are falling apart, a crumbling education system, cities that are falling apart. You know, there's just an issue with the allocation of capital. There's lots of money around. It's just not being put to work in areas of society where it should be. And that has to do, I think, with uh, choices with regard in particular to taxation. It's the same, it's the same in this country. Uh, you, choose, you, know, you tax certain things, you don't tax other things, and you'll end up with, uh, with kind of certain outcomes. Doesn't answer your question, though, sorry.
Yeah, we've a gentleman here. Hello, Paddy. Um, Michael McCarthy, Flynn from Oxfam, Ireland. Um, thanks for your thoughts, and it's, it's, it's really refreshing to see someone getting to the philosophical underpinnings that are often hidden and presumed to be accepted by everybody in, in mainstream policies. The question I'd like to ask to you, equally problematic, the philosophical underpinnings between the mainstream political direction we're taking is the absence or the failure of a philosophical direction on the left of the political spectrum or the failure to be able to elucidate um, a political um, project, um, largely due to so many left parties buying into the existing one. And where does that leave us, both in Ireland and Europe and it could be argued that it's 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 the centre of the cause of the current malaise. Um, you know, yeah. we have a situation in Ireland where we've a ragtag of left parties whose ambition is to get into be the major coalition party with mm. Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael. How do we move beyond that? It's, that's a good question. W one way that y y one could look at it is to take um, polling of the public in Ireland, say, for the last 20 years. And if you look at the issues that people see as the most important or the most in need of being addressed, it has just been housing and health for two solid decades. There's absolutely no ambiguity about that. Uh, but the fact that successive governments um, have not tackled those issues, um, I think, in a way, suggests that there's a, you know, the, the larger issue is, is, is that our, you know, our politicians, it's not, it's not something that's unique um, in Ireland. In the United States, for example, there's great work by a political scientist called Tom Ferguson, you know, which shows the, the tendencies of uh, politicians to be responsive to the needs of uh, smaller groups. Um, and in Ireland, I do think we have, a, we have an issue with certain vested interests overwhelming uh, policymakers. There's kind of a myth in Ireland, which is that our national parliamentarians are bogged down with the small people, uh, fixing potholes and lighting and stuff like that. Well, okay, you can... You can check that out. You can you can look at the work of political scientists and the the level of contact hours of our national parliamentarians and compare it, you know, maybe to MPs in England. And it turns out that in England they're far more parochial. The you know the amount of contact hours our local politicians or our national politicians uh, spend with constituents is, is much lower in Ireland. Uh, it's just a conveniently maintained myth, I think, um, that were it not for the small people, our national parliamentarians would be doing wondrous things, but they're bogged down fixing potholes. It's kind of a, it's a it is a myth. Um, our national parliamentarians are incredibly responsive. They're you know proactively passing legislation granting uh, exceptional tax privileges to you know the wealthiest foreign and domestic investors you know they they rush through emergency legislation to do all manner of things it's just their priorities don't necessarily reflect the priorities of most people and that's been the case for for a long time and i think that reflects a, a deeply unequal society so thomas ferguson would tend to say that the more unequal a society tends to be a democratic society tends to be uh, the more you tend to find policies or policy making, profitable policy making, being captured uh, by vested interests. And it's the same in the United States, and I think to a degree that's the same here. By profitable policy making, I mean policies that actually can enrich a small group of people. There are lots of policies that the government are, you know, very responsive and proactive that don't interfere with the distribution of power or privilege uh, in Ireland. And um, you know, Fine Gael have done some great things, very progressive things. Um, so anyway. Yeah, we just have one here and we'll take yeah. one here after. Just we the mic. Yeah, just over here, please. Yeah. And, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, whichever. Yeah, go on here. Go on here. Hello, Paddy and Michael, indeed. Uh, Don Lochet is my own name. I'm one of three uh, social inclusion representatives. Um, on the Leash PPN, and for those of you that are not familiar with the PPN, it's the Public Participation Network, and I do believe myself it has huge potential to, uh, I suppose, realign some of the political type issues that we have referred to here this morning and indeed seen unfold over a period of time. Um, essentially, in, in simple terms, I suppose, there's three strands, social inclusion, 
uh, community and voluntary and the environment. Um, at a recent uh, national conference of the PPN, I spoke in a supporting capacity uh, following Sean speaking, which wasn't an easy act. Um, but one of the main things that came out of that is we're now in agreement to comprise a national uh, secretariat to support each of the counties and progress the initiatives. I suppose as a social inclusion, one of my main interests is currently with a view to progressing the works of the UNCRPD, which United Nations Convention's rights of people with disabilities. I think it's it's sad we were the last country in Europe to sign up to this. We we signed a commitment to it back in 07. We ratified it last year in 017. And unfortunately now only um, we're trying to put strategies in place with a view to roll it out. I, I really do feel in the context of volatility and you know a sense of alienation and all the rest, this, this sector feels that it is... I think it's a huge uh, political opportunity missed by the current uh, government. Um, that's their baby to deal with, but in terms of the sector, it's for the likes of myself and others to pursue it. I think, with the, and Paddy will know this more than any, with, with the sense of establishment we have in this country in IT, with our abilities, communicators, I think we could be world leaders in this, in this sector and in, in picking up the shortfall. I suppose, finally, I'll finish. When I worked in the UK, I was always very proud to be known as f coming from the land of saints and scholars. And I suppose in the context of this, you know, it's very, very hard to see it unfold. Um, we're due to have a workshop in Lee shortly on issues associated with housing, environment, employment, transport, stuff of this nature. The sense of alignment is there, you know, from Leash County Council through to the National Secretary to Social Justice into the program for government. It's the alignment is there. It's about reinforcing it adequately as what's coming out of the likes of this in the National Conference. I'd just be interested in Paddy's own expertise in terms of businesses, in terms of how, how one might present that in a cohesive manner to get through to, I, I, I know you've presented a, a challenge in already in terms of some of the political, but how one might convey that in a more effective manner. I, I think the structures are there, they're being missed, maybe how they could look, because look, it's not all give, give, gimme, gimme. Mm -hmm. It's about what people with disabilities can give back into you know, the public purse as well. Th Thanks for that. Before, just before you address yeah. that, Penny, I just might take another question from just in terms of time pressure here. Please ju just go on ahead, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, Neve Garvey from Throcra. I really liked your um, closing point. Um, very positive that uh, maybe the power of ideas can trump the power of vested interests. But on the vested interests, um, I was also struck by your earlier point um, on the, the, I suppose, the uh, concentrated corporate power and, and how that can trump the public good. In our own experience in Throcra, I guess, um, we see sometimes, you know, huge corporations with more power than some of the countries where they're operating, having you know horrendous impacts on human rights for local communities, or in the area of climate change, which is against the public interest of everyone everywhere. Uh, we see the role of fossil fuel companies, um, you know, hindering the kind of changes that we need to see for a more sustainable future. So I was just really interested in your own thoughts on uh, the concentration of corporate wealth. What role of, of of government policy or of public action in terms of trying to to uh, improve the human rights and uh, uh, public policy record of, of some of the I, you know, I, I think, and it's only my opinion, for, for all of these issues, both on, you know, disability or, you know, the excesses of, of, of private power, the, the most important group are, are journalists. And, you know, in Ireland, uh, journalists are unusually restricted because of our defamation laws in actually speaking truth uh, to power. I understand entirely the basis for our defamation laws. They were put in place in the 1880s uh, by you know, arguably an occupying power who were very worried at the level of dissent uh, and troublemaking uh, in Ireland. So they, they put in place chilling uh, defamation laws, which you know, effectively remain kind of in place. Uh, we're now an independent and free society, and I think you know, we just need to completely uh, upend our defamation laws. They don't, we don't need to create the most radical free press in the Western world, but maybe just getting to mid-table uh, you know, might be an idea. And if you had a freer press uh, and more journalists that can hold kind of power to account, not just here, but you know, elsewhere, but in particular here, uh, I think you'd end up with a much healthier and better society. I just, I've just one more here. This gentleman behind. Sorry, I just in ter I'm sorry, folks. Just uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, there's huge interest here, but just in terms of time pressures, we'll. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Paddy, Jerry, Care, PPN as well. 
Just a question to Paddy. Uh, philosophical essay there you gave us, but if I was to ask, ask you about unearned income and the various tumours of corporation and all the rest, the crisis in housing at present, what do you think practically can be done in the light of what philosophically you've laid out? I'll just take one more. Yeah, sure. I'll, just, I'll just take one more at the same time, Michelle, just hear this gentleman, just if we could, yeah. Hi, right, Paddy. Um, just an extension, is, I'd say, a little bit on uh, what Neil was asking. Given there's s the, the holders of capital and the holders of power are increasingly international, um, uh, whereas governments are by their nature national, what are your views on international taxation and more harmonisation across uh, and between countries uh, if you feel that, that taxation is really um, the, the answer to, to recapturing uh, power for for, I suppose, a different class of society? Um, I should have written down the first question. I was so taken by the, by the second question, but you, you can remind me. Uh, house, housing is for, for society. Yeah, I, I, I think on housing, um, you know, w one positive step would be, w might be more, m more data. About six months ago, I published, you know, really rudimentary statistics showing that the top end of the market in, 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 uh, in Ireland was, was not just flatlining, but property prices were in decline. Uh, the rate of decline in property prices at the top end of the market in Ireland is now faster than it ever was during the height of the recession. I think the level of silence by professional economists and uh, the commentariat is, is unbelievable. And it speaks to the fact that we just, just aren't properly readily available statistics to shine a light both on, both on the, the extremes of the property market and the incredible harm it's doing to the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and don't give us a window into how few people own, truly own so much property in the country, because that would inform a more robust debate about marginal rates of taxation on property and kind of in different guises. And I think that's that's lacking with regard to taxation. You know, I do think that unfortunately, and it's nobody in Ireland's fault, I do think Ireland has been overwhelmed uh, by very large multinationals over a very long period of time. Um, and, you know, we, we have become in Europe an effective lobby for, an Amer for American multinationals. I, I pointed out, you know, six or seven months ago, using the latest available flow of funds statistics from the United States, that FDI into Ireland is anemic absolutely anemic and the headline figures that are actually used are nothing but an accounting idiosyncrasy. 99.98% of FDI into Ireland in 2016 isn't real. All it represents is non-repatriated profits rolled over in bank accounts into the following year. The total level of FDI into the country is absolutely anemic. And that's, there's been a systemic decline over 20 years. If you look at the total workforce, the total percentage of people employed in multinationals in Ireland over the last 20 years, it's declined. 20 years ago, 30% more people were employed by multinationals. We're just tumbling down through the European rankings. There's been this vast decoupling, but because we lack proper statistics, in my view, in Ireland, and we use these illusory numbers, um, I, I genuinely think our own policymakers and politicians believe that that, 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 that FDI is, is incredible and the numbers are kind of off the charts. It's complete baloney. It's madness. It's an act of delusion. And it's dangerous because there should be an immediate national debate. It shouldn't have been triggered by the data released by the United States uh, in 2016. It should have been happening 20 years ago when the tide began to turn in FDI. And we just became ostensibly used to launder huge volumes of other people's revenues, um, taxable revenues from other countries. Anyway, I just think Ireland's been completely overwhelmed. I don't know how we get out of the situation we're in and how taxes are harmonised. I think it takes Europe um, to, uh, to make that happen and to, to restructure uh, the Irish economy because we're in danger of just having a heart attack and uh, uh, dropping dead in two or three years when taxes are harmonised if we haven't already prepared a plan B for that eventuality. And that would be a terrible place to find ourselves back in. Paddy, thank you very much. That's a very <laughs> enlightening talk, and definitely, I think we, we, we're, we're up and running at a serious rate after a, a, an introduction like that. Thank you very much, Paddy Cosgrave. Thank you very much. That's fantastic.